Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am very excited to be talking to Bitten Jonsson. Did I get that right? Yep, perfect. Awesome. Bitten, hi. Thank you so much for joining me today. Can you share a little bit about your amazing background in sugar addiction and addiction just in general? And then from there also, what brought you to it, especially your personal experience with that? Because I thought that when I heard that, it was a very fascinating backstory. Well, you know, I grew up in a very normal uh, family out in the boonies eating, you know, just plain food. We didn't have, um, I'm born 52, so there are some years ago, and we didn't have money for candy and stuff. It didn't exist at that time. Um, it was good if me and my siblings shared a soda on Easter Eve, sort of, you know. Uh, we weren't spoiled with a lot of junk. And I'm very fortunate because that saved me a lot of trouble. But <clears throat> when I was a teenager, I started working in like a 7-Eleven. Uh, you know, and of course, you know, whew, man, there it was. So, of course, I loved it. And I loved sugar from I was four or five years old. I stole mm -hmm cubes that's all we had for you know the lumps for coffee so that's I used what to I do that too oh you did oh yeah <laughs> I, snuck in. yeah I snuck in you know very careful uh but anyway they weren't available so I couldn't you know splurge on it but as a teenager working extra uh from school and getting my own money you can imagine the chocolate and ice cream were my drugs I've never been a bread lover, but bread, pasta, pizza, all the flour is starch, is sugar. A lot of people don't understand that. I'm so sad that they don't. Besides, uh, the flour destroys the microbiome in the stomach in a horrible way. It's like an abrasive on the very important villi in your intestine. You know, that's for uh, specific functional medicine training, but... Uh, I can't help mentioning that because I see that, that my clients that are bread addicts, they are sicker than the ice cream chocolate addicts mm. in the long run. Mm. They get the same woo-woo in their head, but, you know, they also get very, very sick stomachs and microbiome and biochemistry, which is very sad. Uh, but anyway, so then I went to nursing school and I love that. I did nursing school and, you know, we were dieting all the time. Put a bunch of women together. We diet. It's like, you know, we didn't have to. I can see when I look back, but that's what everybody did. So we start through the weekend, through the week and cottage cheese and fruit. I still hate that. Would never eat it. Ooh. Uh, cold and jacky and no nourishment. <laughs> <laughs> and then on the weekends, you can imagine, we splurged. So, I mean, you know, it was a crazy way of living. But that's what we knew at that time. So and that anyway, was in Sweden, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, this was in Sweden. Oh, yeah, yeah. So anyway, somebody said, if you start smoking, we lose our appetite. And then we lose weight. So we did. And I started smoking like I've never done anything else in my life, you know. I didn't know anything about sensitivity and addiction transfer at that time. Uh, I became nicotine addicted much faster, much heavier due to my sugar addiction, which I had no idea I had before. Because one bug paves the way for the next. That's very important to understand. And that's why I work with something called addiction interaction disorder, one illness, several outlets. Mm. Oh. So, you know, talking only sugar and food, that is really limiting today. You have to understand the big picture. Otherwise, you can't help people. But anyway, so the next step, you know, being in nursing school with a lot, bunch of girls, women, we went out dancing and drinking. That's what you did. That was our culture. I love drinking. I loved it. I split half a bottle of red wine the first evening I drank when I was 19. And my first thought was, why haven't I found this before? <laughs> so now, sugar, nicotine, alcohol. So th to make a long story short, 13 years later, I was married to an American. I met him. He was here in work Sweden working. And I moved over to U.S. And he started objecting about my drinking. And I thought, he's stupid. 
Oh, he's so pretty. Ugh. Um, so no, but I love drinking. Right. You know, I used to take a strong beer before I went out and mow the lawn. I thought that was what everybody should do, right? You know, get <laughs> more speed. mowing the lawn. And I love it. Yeah, but it's interesting too, you know. Drugs, it is in the way that I ask my clients, what did you expect the drug to do for you? Because here, we're all born with the unique biochemistry. So the way one drug, let's take alcohol, which is a sedative, right? It worked at speed on the brain. Mm. Somebody else get down on alcohol. So you can't, you know, take several psychoactive substances anymore and say, this is speed. Well, cocaine is more speed than downer. But I said, I've seen people fall asleep on cocaine. It's rare, but it happens. I've seen people go bonkers on sleeping pills. Uh, but we have to remember that too, that uh, we all have different effects. So I love the speed alcohol gave me. So, but he started objecting to my drinking and I was really upset with him. How could he, you know? Huh? Uh, I was very responsible and working and all that. So, but anyway, finally he forced me into treatment uh, the 26th of September, 1985 at at that time, it was the best treatment center in the world. It was said, uh, Capistrano by the Sea in California, Newport Beach. And I hated it. I was so mad at him. How could he say that I was an alcoholic? Um, but anyway, so I ended up there, you know, and I objected to being there. But they, they hit me with knowledge. You know, they hit me with knowledge. They sent me to University of Irvine studying the dopamine system and telling me you have an illness in your brain. And I go, I never heard that because alcoholics were, you know, people that drank because of trauma or because uh, a horrible childhood or because they didn't have a job, because they didn't have family, they didn't have money, blah, blah, blah. So I learned the totally opposite of that. You lose your job, you lose your money, you lose your family because you drink. You're depressed because you're drinking. You don't drink because you're depressed. So that was the most biggest shock for me as a nurse to mm. totally do a 180 on that. And that is the most important message I have to people stuck in an addiction because we don't do diagnostic on addicts like we should. You know, the instrument for alcohol, pills and drugs called Addis and the one for sugar called sugar. So that's when you see that the addictive symptoms comes long before you become depressed, start diet like an idiot, start starving, binging, and start smoking and all that. So then you can see that my love for sugar was when I was five. But you're young, you're strong, you're healthy. So I didn't get a lot of consequences, right? I gained five kilo, down five kilo, up seven kilo. But I mean, it wasn't like it was a big problem. I had morning anxiety, but I thought everybody in the whole world had that until I quit sugar. No more morning anxiety. <laughs> I didn't understand how it affected my brain, right? I had no knowledge, none. Mm. More than starting to understand this about alcohol, dopamine, serotonin, GABA, endorphin. And I go, wow, like a new world. Mm -hmm. So I quit nursing and I thought, I'm not going to go back to nursing. They don't know anything about this. I'm going to work with addiction. So you could say that I fell in love with addiction medicine, 1985. So I've been sober since. And then, of course, you know, uh, I couldn't. It was, it started to come more the lifestyle medicine to be healthier. Mm. So I thought, oh, I got to quit smoking. So when I've been sober for seven years, I met this specialist from Florida, Terrence Gorski. He was my mentor for many years. Just love the guy. He does, he's no longer with us, but he taught me so much. You can't believe it. I went into training with him. So uh, he told me about the biochemistry about this, and he told me how all this is connected, you know, alcohol, sugar, nicotine, alcohol, pills, drugs, blah, blah. Mm. So anyway, that was my first encounter with that around year 2000. No, it was, it was late 90s, 97, maybe. I don't remember. I should look that up. But anyway, 
uh, that's how my journey started because at that time I worked as a, a program director at a treatment facility uh, in Sweden, you know, a type Minnesota treatment facility, mm. uh, which was great at that time. <laughs> I, I would add a lot of stuff today if I would do it. But anyway, so I said to my um the trainer, we had an American trainer. Her name was Jean Britt. She was absolutely wonderful. So I worked very close with her. And I said one day to her, you know, I can't understand. How come I could quit alcohol and then I quit nicotine, but I can't, I can't quit chocolate and ice cream? She looked me sternly in the eyes and she said, wait a minute. She said, you might be a food addict. <laughs> and I laughed at her. I said, food addict? I don't binge on food. I mean, I don't overeat meat or fish or eggs or butter or, you know. So we didn't understand uh, what in the food that was psychoactive acting on the brain at that time. So I said, food addict. And I said, food? No. <laughs> you know, I wasn't an overeater. So no, I could live on chocolate, but that's it. So anyway, she said, why don't you go to US to do some tra more training on that? Uh, and I said, sure. So I went to Chicago uh, 1993 in October. And I met the people that started looking at food issues like a drug and working, you know, with uh, taking away the drug and recovery and all that. Um, and uh, at Lutheran General Hospital, they had a one week program there. So I went there and I was floored and I could see all the similarities. This is like alcohol like drugs, like anything else in the world. So it was very interesting. So I came home to, back home to Sweden and I started telling people, I'm a food addict. And you know, some people said to me, oh, is that something that is fancy to say in the US? <laughs> people knew nothing here. Right. But people started calling me and said, I heard you talk. And they said, because I've been very open with my addiction. Mm. It's like any other chronic illness for me. Uh, so anyway, they said, they called me and said, could you help me? I'm eating myself to death. Uh, my doctor tells me that I'm crazy. I should move more and eat more carrots. Um, you know, and I can't do it. And I get, I am very sick. I'm depressed. I have no energy. I'm very overweight. Uh, I'm a food aholic. That's what they call themselves. Uh, and I said, well, you have an addiction. And they looked at me like I came from the outer stars or something, but one of my skills is to explain addiction to people. I go into their brain, I draw the brain, I draw, um, you know, receptors and neurotransmitters, and I explain the connection with insulin, with uh, oxytocin, with the uh, hormones, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and, you know, uh, I keep saying, this is what you need to understand. If you don't understand this, you can never handle your illness. And that counts for any other illness. If you have a severe illness, you have to understand what it is. That's the best help for you. And then you can get the tools you need. So I love, I used to say, I don't treat people, I educate them. Mm. So that's what I love doing, you know. And when they hear, so this is addiction, and they go, what? Because there is so much stigma, so much myths, so much stupidity, excuse me, my friends there, but it is out there. And you have to remember that nobody wants to be an addict. Everybody's terrified because they think they're so bad. Mm. It's not, you didn't choose that illness. I also tell people that uh, you need to have a sensitivity in your brain in order to be addicted to these psychoactive substances. And I'll tell you what, that sensitivity, it's your gift. Mm. If you numb, how fun is that? You have, a, you have a sensitive brain and body. That's beautiful. But you need a driver license. If you don't know how to drive this exquisite machine, it can go to hell. So that's what I want to teach people. Yeah. And help them to find their way. Because there is no one pattern there is no one method, no one product. You know, you have to, to give this person a lot of tools so that they can pick. These tools fit me. I need to do this. Oh, those are my consequences. Oh, that's horrible, horrible. But mm -hmm. how will I change it? 
So that's why I have this diagnostic tool that yeah. a lot of people are afraid of using. I talk to my colleagues now. I think they're afraid of using it because it is black and white. You get to know, are you addicted or are you not? Mm. And the way I work, I don't work with the eating disorders at all. I stay way, way from that. But if the eating disorder is a symptom of an underlying addiction, I can help you. Uh, but, you know, uh, so that's why I diagnose people. I'm not going to work with anything else. I'm a hardcore addiction worker. I don't mess around. If you have an addiction, I'm going to tell you. And I'm going to quote another colleague of mine, which I think is very important to hear. Uh, I would do you a disservice if I wasn't honest with you. Yeah. This is a deadly disease. This is going to happen if you can't take away the drug. And my speciality is to help you understand how you take away the drug, how you create a healthy lifestyle, the tools you need you have to try them. It's like a laboratory. You test. Did that work on you? No? Fine. Let's take another one. But, you know, and it is a tedious process. Yeah. It takes at least 18 months, maybe more, to rebuild, to rewire a broken brain. Because your brain is broken. And, uh, you know, I advise you not to do big therapy, uh, change your husband, uh, start a new <laughs> company. I mean, no big things during that time. I want you to really focus on healing the plasticity in your brain, healing the neurons, the, the receptors. And I know how to do that. So I can teach you that. Um, and, and restore the mitochondria. Uh, you know, you see a lot of people working with food and they go, how did you feel when you ate this? Oh God, I am puke at all the messiness with feeling, feeling, feeling. Hey, come on. Yeah. Uh, what's your energy? Yeah. I'm going to ask you, if you eat this for breakfast, what's your energy two hours after? What's yeah. your energy, energy, energy? I work with energy. I've done for a long time. I quit this feeling because when you have a broken brain mm -hmm. from the psychoactive substance, you're going to have false thoughts, negative thoughts false negative feelings can you imagine what's going to happen you know that when you learn to bike you did very very specific neuron connections in your body and your brain to be able to bike if you repeat that you're going to be better and better the same with negative thoughts and feelings if you keep that on repeat can you imagine how you feel lousy so you have to change all that you can't mess around with that. You have to start, uh, you know, and a lot of people have a lot of traumas, a uh, lot of misery going on. Also, a lot you have to remember because this is early exposure. We took our drug very early. So we have missed a lot of the development in the prefrontal cortex, which makes us feeling less than. But, you know, that's not the cause of the addiction. So you have to restore a lot of that and restore your self-confidence, your self-worth. Then you can do anything you want in the world if you have that energy. So simple as that. I've explained it all. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, I'm sure we can go for like an extra hour just, uh, just yeah, an introduction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. going into details. But no. anyway, that's my whole story. And it's going to be 30 years now with this and 38 uh, you know, in recovery from alcohol. And um, I'm working on sort of finding my successors, mm. having people out there that, and I see you and people like Finlay, by like Clara and Casey Ruff, these young, gutsy, courageous people, Amber Wentworth, you're a whole bunch of young people out there. You're half my age, maybe much less. But anyway, I love seeing that, you know, Thanks. I can sit here at my desk and just enjoy. You're out there fighting. I'm not fighting anymore. Mm. I'm done. I just love to spread knowledge. So Thanks. that's where I'm at. I, I appreciate that so much. And it is because of your work that we can now build upon it and continue the same work, you know, and spread the message and 
um, push people to wake up from this kind of zombie state that they're living and not even knowing what what they're doing to their yeah. brain you know yeah yeah on their, their body you know in hyperinsulinemia insulin resistance on and on mitochondria deficiency is yeah. huge because these uh, foods deplete your battery your energy and you start thinking that you're a bad person and why can't I do it? And you think everybody else does because that's the way we look at people. We think everybody else got it and I don't, but that's not true, of course. Uh, you know, and I've been, I'm doing so many four day intensive. That's what I've done a lot through the years teaching. And the interesting thing is that people say the first evening when we start sharing, they look at each other shocked. You have a room full of people and they said, you too? I thought I was the only one. You too? I thought I was the only one. Right. That still blow my mind that they are isolated in this sick world of thinking I'm the only one doing the stupid things to myself, mm. which is the illusion that the red dog wants you to have to keep the drug and the drug life, right? Can you share the re what the red dog means? Because I know what it means because I've watched every sure, interview sure. ever given. Yeah. <laughs> But, yeah. <laughs> Red dog is the addictive, sick part in your brain. Mm -hmm. My dear friend and colleague, Paul Early, addiction specialist, doctor, MD, he called it the addict brain. So there are other names on it. But, you know, I've used uh, Red Dog uh, since the 90s, explaining to people that the illness is the Red Dog. It's incredible, powerful. It's like an enemy within you, but you are not your Red Dog. You have a beautiful blue dog, but we need to feed it, you know. So uh, the question is, who who's going to win? The one you nurture. And that's what I mean with teaching people lifestyle medicine, you know, specific medicine. Um, if you do this, this happens. If you do this, this happens. Ha here's how you feed your blue dog. And this is the way you feed your red dog. And remember... Red dog is cunning, baffling, powerful, and very patient. So it's always going to be there, you know. You can't kill it. So when my red dog speaks up sometimes now, still does after all these years, I laugh and said, oh, are you visiting today? Oh, fun. But, you know, we're not going to do that today. And tomorrow I say the same thing. And that has kept me drug-free and in recovery for years. One day at a time. So only one day at a time. Wow. So, and also you need help because, uh, I mean, if you and I were standing beside each other in the room right now and I said, uh, look at yourself, you don't have a mirror, but you look down, right? You can see your breast, you can see maybe your stomach, your legs and your feet, but you can't see the whole you, Yeah. right? So you need to back off to see the whole you. But, you can ask me to mirror you. I said, tell me what you see. Frog back. Oh, I see this beautiful woman, long hair, blah, 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 blah. So that's how we help each other. We can say things like, hmm, I hear your red dog talking. You trying to talk yourself into using. No, I don't. Yes, you do. Because one that has a red dog hears it right away. But you know, the funny thing, I don't hear mine. Well, because it's much, much harder to hear mine because it has developed the language which it can fool me with. <laughs> uh, so, you know, yeah. but my, my recovering friends, they pick up right away. I love oh, that. And that's the know, I feel coaching. Like, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's why we always work in group. I don't work one-on-one -on -one with addicts because that's like chasing a slippery soap in the slippery bathtub. They don't get that identification process group 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 yes yes a lot of people I, I, are afraid of group because yes. they think they're going to be exposed right. no group is the best teaching yeah. room a room full of addicts can teach each other more than any textbook any lecturer uh you know that's why a good group leader can you know set the temperature and run that group into growing and helping each other to face the red dog because the red dog is your enemy. You know, it's not something outside. So I can help you 
get a whiff of your red dog and you can say, oh, now I know why I think like that or do this or fool myself into this. Oh, got it. Connection. So that's how you can change. Love and it. also a lot of people think that talk therapy is the thing to do with this. Uh -huh. uh -oh. Useless in the beginning. Uh, you know, uh, we all have, that's why people are so stuck on feelings, but actually before any feeling, there's a thought. So the chain is thoughts, feelings, urges, actions. Mm -hmm. I'm tired. Oh, I'm tired. My boss is rotten. Feeling, ooh, I would like to numb myself. <laughs> Urge, go and get chocolate. Behavior, go and get chocolate. That's very destructive, right? If you pick those four apart, mm -hmm. but you know, you can't start with the thought and the feeling. That's going backwards. That's going to aggravate the whole thing. So you have to start with changing it. I called you. We're friends. Support. And I said, uh, my red dog wants to go and buy chocolate because I'm pissed at my boss. And you said, okay, now have a glass of water, take a walk, go home and eat your dinner. I'm here. Call me again when you've done that. You change action. That's the only way to start. You start from the bottom up. And then you start looking at your urges. Oh, yeah, my urge was to go and buy this. But, you know, that's very stupid. <laughs> that's going to go to hell. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to call you again later that night and said, you know, I did it. And I feel much better. Thank you for being there. Mm. And then uh, I can examine what kind of feeling did I have him for? I just look at it like I look at, you know, knowledge. What what was the feeling? Well, I feel, felt tired and lousy. What was the thought? My boss is shitty. Well, so I should eat chocolate because my boss is shitty. Do you see the stupid thought patterns we end up in? So that's why you have to start with changing action without understanding all of that. You don't have to analyze because analysis creates paralysis. Then you're, oh, what could cause that? And what happened? You just, I just called you and said, help, help, help. Emergency, red dog is out, whiffing around. What shall I do? Wow. I, yeah, I, I just, I, everything you just mentioned, and I see that also with my clients, same thing, you know, um, and I, and I do that with my one-on-one -on -one clients also. I'll do sometimes when I notice they're struggling or they're trying really hard to hang on to that addictive substance that's still remaining on the meal plan, um, then I'll do, okay, so this week, every single day, I want you to update me at this time and this time, you know, and then right. just to create that momentum for like yeah. a week or two or three, and then they're good. And then, okay, yeah. now we're good. And then the brain is healing over time as you're sober. Of course. From the and the craving goes down and the insulin goes down and the body start, your stomach start functioning again. And you yeah. start, you know, because your neurotransmitters are made in your stomach. So, yeah. you know, it starts healing. And uh, I'll tell you a very interesting story. Uh, if we have time, just a couple of minutes. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, this was one of the first groups I had in 1995. I had this woman and I was teaching them to call each other and reach out when something happened. And also they had a plan from, we had meeting once, one, eight hours once a week, one day in a week. So they had a program, homework, assignment until next week. So her assignment was to not go shopping for food on her way home from work when she was tired. She had to plan and prepare and all that. So anyway, she came back and she told us that she was going to the, she forgot about that. She just ignored it. <laughs> so on the way home from work, she said, well, I need to pick up, you know, the excuses. You need to pick up eggs or whoa, whoa. So she did. And when she's in the store, you know how the candy shelves are in Sweden from floor to ceiling. I mean, candy. You know, all kinds of candies you can imagine in the world. And the smell is, the smell could actually give you coma. Uh, <clears throat> it's horrible. But anyway, so she gets transfixed in front of that, hypnotized. She's just standing in front of that, looking, smelling. Oh, uh, shall I eat? No, I shouldn't eat. I'm going to, I'm going to group. But I could, I can have some tonight and I don't tell them and it's not going to show and I can quit tomorrow. You know, all that bull mm -hmm. that we tell ourselves. 
But then finally she remembered, what should I do in that emergency? I made them, they had made little cards. So she took up a card and turned it and said, call, and then there was a name. So she called the lady on the card and she told her exactly what's going on. And the lady said, okay, take it easy, take it easy. I'm going to talk you out of the store. So she said to her, you know, because this is powerful, horrible, powerful. Okay, turn around. What do you see uh, behind your back? Oh, cleaning equipment. Okay, walk over there. Tell me what the floor mops and everything cost. So she got to refocus. And she talked her out of the store because she had food at home, you know. And people think this is so silly and stupid. But this is what you have to do. It works. You have to connect. Because, yeah, it worked. Because... You cannot fight that red dog alone. I love that. I'm going to add that. Uh, I also have group coaching. So I'm going to. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So yeah. Use that, it. Right. Use it. Just it works. Tip. Yeah. Because they're already there. They know uh, they yeah. know each other. And so they yeah. can uh, pair up, you know, yeah. and have yeah. a sponsor similar to AA. Yeah. 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 Or an accountability person or whatever you want to call it. I love that. Uh, somebody that they connect with. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then eventually, again, the longer it's been since your last use, your yeah. brain is healing. Right? Yes. And so you yes. need that less and less and less over there. Yeah. And then you need to work with relapse prevention. You know, you need to be aware of your risk situations, which you work with solution focused therapy on. And then you have to be aware of your hidden warning signs. Everybody has some hidden warning sign, things that could trigger us without us really thinking of it. Mm -hmm. The most common one that people forget about is being tired. It's like they totally ignore that. It's like you're not allowed to be tired. So when I, you know, dig into them, they said, what happened? How did you feel? What did you think? Blah, blah, blah. Well, I was tired and irritated because I was stressed. Yeah, see? Did you do anything about that? No. <laughs> right. Okay. So what the tools we're going to work here now? What are the tools when you're tired? Because all of us will run into days when we're really tired, right? Well, I can take a salt shot. I can have water. Uh, I can do my breathing exercise, which I love with my little relaxator. You know, I can do all kinds of stuff to because it's only going to be about 10 minutes and then you're okay again but people think oh i'm so tired i'm never going to do this and they feel miserable right so we these are to... the things yeah no i'm sorry go ahead no but those are some of the simple tools you teach people people yeah. think it's no rocket science i'm telling you love it yeah the emotional management skills right the, what are all of the yeah you have to behavior? well behavior man you have yeah. to change behavior Mm. action 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 so it's not what did you feel about it no it's what are you gonna do about it what's the action you're taking now is that go home yeah. and take a nap or what are you gonna do 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 yeah. do i love you know i'm a star wars space freak so i usually say do or do not there is no try joda I love that. that. I that's one of my favorite quotes ever. Yeah, uh, mine too. Yeah, so true. Because the moment you say I'm gonna try to do something, you've already failed. <laughs> like, in the program, in the twelve step program, we said trying is lying. What are you gonna do? What's your commitment? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. not about you know because we we you absolutely can have one thousand percent control, right? And so when you say I'm gonna try, you're removing your your strength, you're, you've disempowered yeah, yourself. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, I'm going to wait and see, you yeah, know, so, right. you, know, you choose, yep. you know, is yeah, it going to be yeah. uncomfortable? Yes. But that's how yeah. you earn sobriety. Why? Right. Know, just that's how you connect. That's how you make new neurons, mm -hmm. neurons that wire together, fire, fire together, wire together. Mm -hmm. So it's very simple. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, I even explained that. So I teach uh, nutrition <laughs> at Miami yeah. Dade College. Yeah. And um, we talk a lot about mindset stuff because everything I talk about is about addiction. And so I am not teaching them about the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, horrific dietary guidelines, you know? So what I'm teaching them is 
the importance of going back to our ancestral diet, the carnivore diet, yes, species yes. specific, right? Yeah, and love so, it, love it, love it. Thank you. Yeah. And so a lot of that means having to break down their addictions. And so in order to break down their addictions, we have to talk mindset and um, brain chemistry. And so I show them like the, there's so much talk about it where I actually show them how neuroplasticity happens, you know, when your brain, yeah. starts, you know, oh, I love together. it. Right. And the fat you need in the neurons. Yes. And in the cell, the layer of fat is so extremely important for the receptor to function because you could have a lot of neurotransmitters. If you have a broken receptor, I use, you know, the key in the keyhole, you could have yeah. tons of keys. But if the keyhole is broken, how are you going to get the key in? Exactly. Like yeah. the receptors, you know, for the neurotransmitters, if they get destroyed, yeah. you know, yeah. I, yeah. I the fatty of acid profile is extremely important in your brain. Mm. And that's why I tell them we are made for animal based fat. Yeah. I'm sure and you get a lot of fish. Plant based is so good. And I go, oh, no. <laughs> that's that. Even here, I mean, all over the world, you know, how many people, um, really understand the value of going back to our species specific diet or going back to eating animal you know it's, we get a lot of pushback and it's it's growing and it's every money. day it's yeah. money and pushback you know fake meat is very cheap to do on cheap horrible ingredients right you know plant-based and all the uh the poison that's in the, the plants you know by itself the anti-nutrients the oxalates the blah blah the lectins and all that People yes. don't want to hear it. Yeah. 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 Exactly. We have we have a big, big vegan mafia, as I call them in Sweden. It's so true. We so the whole food industry in the United States is a trillion dollar industry. I know. And, right. I know. And it scares start, me. Right. And the vast majority of that is what? It's plants. It's grains. It's beans, you know, sugar. Sorry. Soy. Exactly. Yeah. What percentage yeah. of that is actual meat is minuscule. And so this yeah. is the problem is that and they're funding just Coca-Cola alone funds 11 times, spends 11 times more money on funding basic nutritional research as compared to our NIH or the National Institute. Yeah, of Health. I know. You know, I know. So what kind of science do you get? So when I you remember the totality of evidence. It's it horrible. Like I remember Marion Nestle was over here in Sweden many, many, many years ago. Yeah. I tell you what, nothing has happened in Sweden. We're constantly going backwards. You know, I used to explain it when people ask me how my work is. I have a spaceship, real heavy duty spaceship. I go and land that. And, you know, it's Stonehenge where I come out of the <laughs> spaceship. I'm in the Iron Age Stonehenge. <laughs> when it comes to this topic and i'm like oh man yeah i can only we're dangerous. back in sweden now right pardon me you're back in sweden now yeah i lived in i, I moved back in 89 hmm. 88 sorry okay. spring of 88 so i lived there from 82 to 88 right so when i was I've been over many years old. times screening but you know yeah right no, i'm back home and it is Thank God I have an international community of people like you and many others. Otherwise, you know, I would probably go bonkers. I can imagine. Yeah, because yeah. I feel like here we're kind of driving this message a lot in the United States. But, you know, if I think of any other country, it's going to be like, it's definitely not going to be at the same kind of uh, edge of, of this time. No, 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 you no. Know? Well, uh, the public health collaboration in UK are doing a beautiful job. You should look into Dr. David Unwin. I used to joke and tell him, God, I wish I could clone you. I wish I could clone you. He doesn't work with addiction, but he does an incredible job with diabetes type two to reverse it. And they do include knowledge about addiction. His wife has done training with me. She's a psychologist, you know, so they are putting a dent into UK, but over here, Oh, Stonehenge. You're, you're, There's not you're, one doctor. I don't know one doctor, uh, doctor's office here where the doctor works with low carb keto. Wow. Not one in the whole Sweden. Not one. That's crazy. I wonder. Is it? That's, yeah, it's so hard yeah. to believe that such a progressive country can. It's, it's you know, so backwards when it comes to food. Yes. That is so horrible, horrible, horrible. 
So yeah. that's why I started working international because, you know, I was just sick and tired of all the resistance here in Sweden over all the years. Yeah. And then you take one step forward and three back. Right. One forward, three back. And what that's your... pretty tiring in the long run. Yeah. What are your dietary guidelines, the official dietary guidelines like? Oh, you know, the like the, what do you call it in US, you know, the standard diet, huda huda. You should eat a little bit of everything and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and now they came with new ones and yeah. they reduced meat, reduced meat. And, you know, I just go, holy mackerel. Can you imagine how many more sick people we're going to get? I'm thinking, you know, there's not going to be any money for uh, the old people's care when my time comes. Um, you know, I have to probably go and jump from a bridge or something. <laughs> Uh, well, but, you know, no, because all the all the money in the healthcare system will be uh, treating the consequences of this lifestyle. The consequences, right. never addressing the cause. And the obesity rate is probably the Ooh. much better. Yeah, 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 yeah. And children, up. children. Oh, so it is just as bad. I don't know why I have this idea in my head. Um, Although when I did do some research, so we all have this idea, like Europe, it's not so bad. But every time I have to research and put out content on YouTube, I remember doing one on France. It's like half the population is now overweight or obese. Half. Yeah. You know, and you know, yeah. India, India used to have very slim people because they were poor and, you know, didn't eat a lot of junk. Right. The diabetes, diabetes type two rate has increased with 43% the last four years. So this is everywhere, wow. everywhere, everywhere. Yeah. I remember you saying in one of the interviews, you don't work with vegans in order nope. to get them sober nope. anymore. Can you share it, it a does. little bit more? Well, they eat only carbs and they eat very unhealthy food. They have tremendous amount of mal malnutrition and they are absolutely fanatic about not changing because they think they have it right. So they are so sick, you can't work with them. They don't understand what you say. Wow, that's that's heartbreak. It's funny, but it's, it's so many, heartbreaking. Many years it's, it's it's yeah, it's probably twenty years since I quit working with vegans. I tried, but it was like scratching on ice. Yeah, it's, it's so I tell them do you want to have a recovery. Pardon me. It's pure addiction. That's all they eat is carbs. Yes, yes. Even if they're not addicted, they are like so, so locked into their thought process that you can't. They will not accept that we're made for animal-based food. Yeah. It's that cult-like, it's almost like a religion. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You know? yeah. It's like a religion. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, I know. That, that doesn't get updated. At least other religions keep updating. It's like, you know, <laughs> the Bible said, what? That the earth was flat and everybody believed it. At least now they're like, well, maybe it's, maybe not take it so literally. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. maintain you know, your religion. I have a cartoon picture of, the flat earthers, which I call the vegans many times, <laughs> flat earthers. Oh, and you know, it is a flat earth and the sun is shining only on one side. It's day all 24 hours, daytime because it's you know, the light. It's hysterical funny. Oh my God, that's that's hilarious. Yeah, so, it is. Um, I want to circle back to the eating disorders because the vast majority of registered dietitians, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, can't say it without rolling my eyes. <laughs> they don't believe in addiction and they prefer to put the blame on the individual and label them like you have an eating disorder. Or the family or the mom or trauma yes. or some psychological issue. Yeah, right. I know. Yeah. And let's let's yeah. heal I'm your sure. eating addiction or whatever, you know, eating disorder you have, you know, by teaching you how to eat a deep fried Oreo with intention. Yeah. And like, you know, people said here, why don't you have uh, uh, one and a half or half a cup of soda between meals? So you're craving it, you know, down or ice cream or I mean, it's so stupid. So you 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 just roll your head. Uh, so uh but, you know, um, there is, if you go into uh, talking eating disorder, and also I have a list of names, which this problem is called binge eating disorder. And did, 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 so there are, 
and everybody has their knowledge and their view and their treatment method. And of course, everybody talks about moderation because that's what the client likes to hear, right? Right. Or it's a diet, a period, and then you go back to eating your drug. Uh, you know, talking about addiction is so much tougher. That's why I developed this sugar instrument, the diagnostic tool, mm. because doing that, I said, okay, well, if you think that way, why don't we do a sugar? Then we'll know. No, I don't want to do sugar. Okay, then I can't work with you. That's my take because there is no meaning arguing. And the interesting thing, the clinic that I taught in Stockholm and trained, Sockerskolan in Stockholm, they do sugar on every client step through the door. They didn't before. They started February 19 to do that, 2019. And I asked, interviewed Jessica, the boss. I interviewed her and I said, what do you see? What are the benefits of doing this diagnostic tool on everyone that you're going to work with? And she said, well, there are so many. I map out all the consequences. I see when it started because... Uh, we know that the further back you look, the further forward you can go, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you get the whole picture, the progression of the addiction curve and the weight curve, and you can see how metabolically dysfunctional they are. It's a beautiful tool. So anyway, and then she kept saying more compliance, you know, more motivated, uh, easier to teach them, more awake, awake, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then she said to me, uh, last thing she said, and it prevents burnout among staff. And I said, what? Take that again. What do you mean? Well, I don't have to argue with them. They just whip out the checklist and the curve and said, well, wait a minute. You can't do that because you're an addict. Uh... Non-addicts, harmful users, social users, they can do that. They can eat that. They can do stuff like that. But you can't. You have chronic, deadly progressive illness, brain illness of addiction, period. That's beautiful. Which brings me to what I think most people are afraid of or move away from. And it's that label, right? When we say it's a disease. Yeah, or it's an illness. which is great. It's, it's the thing that's going to free you. But oh. that's it. I think what people... Uh, the reason why people stay away or steer clear from this topic is because um, most people think that when something is a disease or an illness, it means it is forever going to be there and you'll always, you're stuck in that, in that, you know, and you have to live in fear every day. And, you know, oh, this is a trigger. It's this the is, opposite. You know, what that that's what they don't get. You know, they don't know the other part no, of it. No, that's why and, they need knowledge. It's very important to educate them. You know, you can have a chronic illness and you can die from something else because it's in remission. Yeah. That's what we do. There are so many other chronic illnesses where people go into remission. Yeah. And they never have a flare up again because like type they, 2 diabetes, right? You yeah. can reverse it. Multiple sclerosis. I have friends, yeah. you know, colleagues, a doctor that I work with. She has been in recovery for that 1985. Same time, you know. I say, I'm, I am an alcoholic, or I used to say, I have the illness of addiction. One of my outlets was alcohol. Why do you say you are an alcoholic? Shouldn't you say that you was an alcoholism? And we said, well, it is alcoholism, not wasm. Because if I would forget that, what, what they think is that you can go back to drinking or go back to eating, but that's absolutely no, no. We know for sure that once that pathway in your brain is there, you can't take it away. But you don't have to activate it. You can create hundreds of new ones, you know, and live a very fully life. So you don't have to feel sick one day. But I tell you what, if you're an addict and you keep taking the drug, I'm gonna show I can show you the horrible, horrible illness curve, amputating a leg, getting blind depressed, suicidal. Is there anything more you want to know? Dementia. Should I tell you anything more? Everything. That's what's going to happen if you don't quit the drug. And that's what's happening to the vast I know, of I know. Americans. Oh, I see it all the time around me. I, oh, um, right? you know, um, I have to let go every day because I want to cry sometimes when I go to the store, when I read about people, 
it is so painful. That's why I don't work with clients anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm done. Uh, you know, it, it, I've had enough. Absolutely enough. I've seen enough. I still see enough, but I can, you know, go home and think, okay, it looks horrible. So what kind of piece of lecture should I give my students? The ones that go to go out and work and the knowledge that I can share with you. So you go out and do it because I'm done. I'm old and done. Yeah. Yeah. It, I it takes a teach. lot I out of you. I, 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 I under, I, it does take a lot out of you um, because you have it to pour done. energy yeah. into your client. Um, I, and yeah, I, um, I understand. I loved it. I loved it when I did it. But one day after thousands and thousands of clients, I just woke up one day and knew I'm done. So now you train people and you yeah, all I train the next generation. Yeah, I train the next generation, uh, sugar addiction, addiction, total addiction counselors. And I certify people in sugar so that they can do that on clients so they can help them see the truth mm. and start their recovery journey. So that's what I do nowadays. Do you have a YouTube channel? I don't think... Uh... Yeah, I do. But, you know, I'm... I'm lousy. I need to be better on social media. I need to have somebody do it with me because I don't have time. And when I'm off, you know, I'm not on social media. I'm out uh, chasing bugs on my roses. Uh, I have a dog. Uh, when we're out walking, I don't listen. I, I'm focused on her. Yeah. Uh, I have a big family, sisters and nieces and nephews. And so that's what I do. Uh, you know, I live a very down to earth life i'm not a lot in front of the screen yeah unless I, I'm teaching. right i i can definitely share with you some resources and people that are like just phenomenal at what they do because i me too i've gotten to a point um where i just don't have time to do that my editing anymore i don't have time to put the timestamps on the youtube video so i've just started i don't editing. either i don't and it's you know it doesn't um, amuse me yeah it's no. boring of course, no, yeah. I do a lot like this, you know, interviews, mm -hmm. and I hope that's enough. And the big thing I'm doing now, the last year, is translating my book into English, finally. Should have been done several years ago. Now I'm doing it. So that's prior one. When and in the title? summer, I work when it's raining, and when it is sunshine, I'm off out there. I'm a nature lover, so I'm out in nature. I love that. What is it? The name of your book? So I can, I'll link it below. Sugar bomb in okay. your brain. Sugar bomb in your brain. Yeah. Okay. And we have a group on Facebook mm -hmm. with, I think, 10,600 members mm -hmm. uh, called Sugar Bomb in Your Brain. So welcome, but please answer the questions. Otherwise, we won't let you in. Yeah. Where you can share. And uh, I don't update a lot, but I have a few people out there that's updating. And people, it is for knowledge and sharing. And there is no talk about food. That's no, no. You can't post pictures about food or drug, drug foods or anything. You have to talk about the addiction and recovery. Gotcha. Um, yeah, there are, we have another site, another uh, web Facebook page, Sugar Free Cookbook, which is also one of my books. I'm not going to translate them because I hate recipes. Ooh. Believe it or not, I actually uh, have a, a keto dessert cookbook. It's still up on Amazon. <laughs> that was, oh, yes, I know, oh, I know. That was even oh. after I did my dissertation. So my dissertation was like five years all about addiction, especially um, sugar addiction, right? <laughs> You'd think after defending a dissertation on sugar addiction, you would stop eating sugar, but no, <laughs> I was doing keto. I'm like, okay, well, let's, know, maybe if I do keto treats, oh. Yeah. I see this all the time today. People uh, have all these keto desserts and keto substitutes, keto pizza, keto bread. And we can't eat that. It's yeah. going to trigger. And remember that we have the sensitive, most sensitive brain. So cue-induced craving is deadly for us. So if I were to look at chocolate ice cream, even if it's so-called keto, you know, that would trigger me. It would blow up. It's in my reward center and said go get it go get it yeah. you know and i would probably maybe take that one then mm. uh, to start with but that would make an explosion in my head and then off i go right 
And then, so that's like how say, so many put. So yeah. a serious side do not have keto desserts and keto um, fake food, keto substitutes. Yes. We don't use that. Which, uh, yeah, absolutely. I agree. Oh, and and uh, th a lot of people... Or also... addicts. I don't care about harmful users. I don't care about social mm -hmm. users that want to change. They are uninterested in my way. I'm talking for the yes. addict. Yeah. I would add, though, even the harmful users who are the people who might not be at the severe end of the addiction, I would say, because I, I can see, like, as they get older, we the rate of regeneration of D2 receptors or dopamine receptors, this starts to <clears throat> Totally, down. yeah, absolutely. You know, you start absolutely. actually the where where you may have said, oh, I'm, I don't, I, I'm not an addict or like, I'll have it here and there just for fun. But as yeah. time goes on, you start noticing that they, it starts getting harder and harder for them to yeah. and restrict. I'll tell that. you what, this is happening with alcohol too. Yes. I mean, we had a culture where older people didn't drink a lot. Today, older people travel and drink. So we see more people being alcoholics. <coughs> yes. Excuse me, in that age group. Yes. Yeah, bless you. Yeah. Um, oh, horrible. I want to circle back because we we're talking about the artificial sweeteners and how they're just just as addictive, probably even more so. As a matter of fact, I think something that snapped me out of my denial was when I read the studies on heroin, the artificial sweeteners being far more addictive than heroin. For some reason, when I wrote my when I when I was working on my dissertation and I was read I was writing the literature review, I only had access to um, the cocaine studies, how you know artificial sweeteners were far more addictive than cocaine. And for some reason, I didn't think that was a big deal. I don't know why in my brain. I was like, ah, cocaine, that's not, uh, yeah. that's not so, so bad, you know? We've all been there, we're, we have all been there, yep. Right, so um, I had finished writing my literature review when the heroin studies came out in 2017. So I didn't okay. include that, I didn't even know they existed. So I think for me, a major thing that kind of shook me to my core was when I read those studies. I was like, wait a second, now this is getting serious. And so it seems like, and, and in those studies, they've used artificial sweeteners, like the heroin studies, they used saccharin. They didn't even use regular sugar, right? In the cocaine studies, they've at, at least used regular sugar and artificial sweeteners. And, you know, we, we know the answer. It's the sweet taste. It doesn't matter where it comes from. It's a sweet taste that's far more well, addictive than cocaine. Well, in heroin, it was, you know, also the ar artificial sweetener is far more addictive than heroin, you know? I know. And, and you have to remember that if you have an addiction, uh, seeing the food will trigger dopamine, uh, endorphins. It would trigger the whole system without you putting it in your mouth. Sure. And <clears throat> feeling the the sweet taste in your mouth will trigger insulin release, and also obsessing about food will trigger insulin because your body is made in the way. Let's do preparation because here he's here comes food. So yes. in this, uh, th these are one of the things that make sugar addiction the, the most difficult addiction to treat. It is so available, early exposure. The surrounding don't want to acknowledge it, so they keep pushing. And constant exposure. Mm. And the craving is worse than anything because it is sort of fussy. But it is huge craving due to the Q-induced uh, exposure. So that makes it really hard, you know, because, you know, you don't go out in the store and go to the gas station and you have a jar of cocaine in front right. of you but you have candy and you have the smell of bakery. You have always, always smells and all those big things uh, luring you, you know, triggering you. Wow. So it takes a lot of development, a lot of new uh, neurons and connections in order to withstand it and a lot of support. Yes. And yeah. the reason why um, I wanted to focus on this topic is um to go over the hierarchy of addictive substances because so and if the studies are showing that that sweet taste is far more addictive than heroin we're yeah. actually eating worse things we're eating combinations yeah. like a donut yeah. is not just the sweet taste it's no. also the fat 
with it, the salt. The... Yes, as soon as you combine salt, fat, sugar, flour, all that. Caffeine that's from the a chocolate. Combo. Yes, yeah. exactly. I know some people say that fat is addictive. I said, absolutely not. Try eating a jar of lard, unflavored lard, and see how much <laughs> you can eat. Uh, salt is addictive. No, try eating only salt for a day. Uh uh. -uh. Yeah. But you know, as soon as you mix it, yeah, with carbs and with sugar or sweeteners or what have you, then off you go because it gives salience, tremendous amount of salience. But uh, I think it's very dangerous to start talking about fat and salt being addictive. Yeah, by themselves, you're I right. I don't agree with that at all. You're right. It's only when you add the, so for example. Yeah, yeah. so salty butter is more palatable than unflavored, unsalted butter. Unsalted butter, yeah. Meat. Yeah. Uh, you know, so it, it's as soon as you, you start eat, adding one thing or another thing, the more you add, the more lethal it's going to be. It's kryptonite, right? Boom. Mm -hmm. Off your brain go and your body and your insulin and uh, right, but yeah, the, the moment and all the, that. I, and yeah, but only when the carbs are out of the question. Like how? Like I'm not a proponent of eating um, t sticks of butter. There's this trend um, that I that that got out of control in the carnivore community, where um, people thought like to overcome their cravings, meaning their sugar addiction. They should just eat every time they have a craving, just have butter and butter and butter. And people are gaining weight and weight and weight. No, <laughs> of course they do. Of course they right? do. Because, you know, you have to remember if you have a food plan, you can't eat uh, 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 as much as you want. You have to start limiting food because our bodies are not made for that. So it's going to start getting panic and, you know, frantic and start, you know, storing it away. That's why we recommend for sugar addicts three meals a day, three, you know, normal meals a day, nothing in between, nothing. Last meal, five or 6 p.m. And the next breakfast earlier, you know, we don't recommend fasting because that is like pushing a Pilates ball under the water. It's going right. to blow up in your face. Especially uh, in the initial phase. I think that's, I, I mentioned, I stress that so yeah. much to my clients. If you're just starting to come work with me or starting to want to get sober, don't force yourself to fast, especially no, no. when we have a Maybe you could use fasting. fasting as a medical uh, protocol together with the professional once you can master three meals a day, three normal meals a day. Then if you have problems, you know, with insulin resistance or so, we can try to take away one meal we monitor, we assist you, uh, you know, people hear the word fasting and they starve and drink water for four days and then they collapse and binge like idiots. Mm. Uh, I've seen this so many times and they, you know, it's not, not going to work, of course. So you have to do it under supervision for a medical problem um, together with a pro then it could be okay. And also, I don't like the word fasting at all. I like the word time-restricted eating mm. because addicts trigger on the word fasting. It's like diet. Oh, is there a new diet? Diet? Oh, they love the word diet. They start blinking in their eyes, you know. Yeah, I think After, a lot of no people... Diets. There is no diets. I, I love that because I, I what I've started to notice is that a lot of people jumped on carnivore because it was the next new thing. It's like we're oh, doing yeah. keto and then everybody realized they're still addicted. They're still having binges, but now because like they didn't binges. treat the addiction, they didn't deal with addiction. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, in my protocol, food and biochemical repair, which is a whole battery of things, is 10 percent. Mm. 40 percent is this behavior change. Thought, feelings, urges, action, risk situation, uh, warnings, um, hidden warning sign. And then 50% uh, is support. Mm -hmm. The mirroring. Yeah. Join a group, hire a coach. Yeah. Find the tribe, a community. Yeah. That doesn't Learn about community. your red dog. That's your yeah. enemy. Not the world out there. Your own red dog is your very sweet talking, insidious flattering blah blah, blah. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> and yeah. can you can as I try to uh, end our uh, discussion today, can you give our audience a little bit of hope <laughs> and that is a tremendous, yes. Yeah, there's a tremendous amount of hope. Once you quit the drug and you go on a, you know, this kind of a healthy drug-free food plan, you know, it is horrible in the beginning. But, you know, that's when you need support. We're going to support you one minute at a time, one hour at a time, just one more day. Because the reward after they start waking up after 10 days and said, oh, my goodness, my energy is coming back. Uh, I'm clear in my head. Things start tasting much better, uh, you know. But then they say, of course, oh, how am I going to do this for the rest of my life? Can I never have blah, 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 blah. And we said, no, it's not ever, never. It's only for today. <laughs> so you back off, you know. And then you start working on breathing, on sleep, on physical activity. You work on supplements. There's a whole battery we use which is the biochemical repair, right? So we teach them all these tools and how to uh, coping strategies for stress, how to deal with all the situations. And we teach them to work gr a solution focused in group. Like if you and I were in a group and hopefully some more people, and let's say I have a scary situation tomorrow, tomorrow at work. Oh, how am I gonna do it? We're gonna have cake testing at work. <laughs> Oh, yeah, just an example. And I said, if this was your problem, what would you do? We don't tell each other what to do. We ask each other, if this was your problem, what would you do? If this was your problem, what would you do? So we collect ideas. Right. And then sort of go back to myself. Oh, never thought of that. That's interesting. Did you try that? Yeah. Did it work? Yeah. Okay, good. You keep asking, and that's how you develop your incredible toolbox. So then I tell you, as a group leader, I said, okay, now you go home and try. But first of all, what do you go, which is your strategy tomorrow in this situation? Well, I'm going to do the, I'm going to bring food. And when they put up the cakes, I take a walk and then I come back or I call you about, I call somebody and da, da, da. So that, okay, write down your strategy. That's your strategy tomorrow. And then come back and tell us. And you come back and say, it worked beautiful. Oh, wonderful. But, you know, I thought of one thing. I should have done this too. You came up with something because this makes you be creative. So then you think, oh, next time I'm going to do this too. Oh, nice. That's how you develop. So it's people think that if I say, oh, I'm an addict, somebody tells me how to live. Controlled and ruled. It's the totally opposite. That's red dog bullshitting you, saying that. Mm. That's wrong. It's not. It's freedom. It's being happy, joyous, and free. Exactly. That is about. what food freedom is. And that's the complete yes. opposite of what all of the other food companies. Yes. Otherwise, you chase the food all the time. Yeah. You binge on it. You shop it. You binge it. You feel miserable, remorse. Yes. You feel sick. And then you think, and oh, but tomorrow I'm going to start on the diet again. And you're on this roller coaster. Right. And then course. what? And it's just, it drives me mad when i see those instagram or or youtube shorts of a dietitian trying to eat and teaching us how to eat an oreo with a glass of milk with intention so that you have this food for oh, intuitive eating what a load of bs for addicts oh. Yeah, if I were to do that, you know, my red dog would say, let's have chocolate for breakfast, lunch and dinner today and tomorrow and the next day. And Me I would too. be deadly sick. Me too. So stupid. Me too. You are increasing the craving. Yes. Work it's on like, the let me see. All I see is heroin. It's like, it's like it's she's insane. teaching yeah. us I how to have it. Right? Oh, I feel for a drink before I drive. <laughs> exactly. Oh my God. Okay. Well, um, I just want to ask you one more thing with regards to your goals and where you see yourself in the next few years and, and where are you taking everything that you have done? Where are you going with that? Oh, teaching. Keep teaching, keep coaching my students, uh, keep being there, um, keep being a backstage fighter today, you know, 
I go, yeah, go get him. Yeah, go get him. You know, I don't have, I can coach it. If I go out again, you know, no, but I can coach many. Mm -hmm. So I keep supporting them and coaching them and teaching them and sharing everything I've learned and all my experience of all these years. And of course, getting my book out uh, in English. That's my first big dream. And on the top, on, on the other side, um, you know, I'm just going to have fun and play. That's fantastic. Couldn't come yeah. up with an even better plan. So that's, I love it. Thank you so much, Vitten. <laughs> Thank Johnson, you. For being with us today. Where can people find you to work with you and well, do more? Well, uh, if anyone needs help, they can email me and I can refer. Tell me where you are. And, you know, if you want help, I can refer you to my big, big team. You can also go to my website, Bitten's Addiction. It's like bitten 2 tsaddictioncom uh, You can find information there and also counselors there. Um, you can go to Instagram, although I'm not very active right now because the book is prior one, uh, has to be. Um, and I have a LinkedIn, Bitten Johnson, uh, and Facebook, and the group Sugar Bomb in Your Brain on Facebook. So there are several places to try to reach me if you need help. Um, and I encourage you to dare do the sugar so that you really get a full picture of your life, what's happened until today. And uh, doing that, you also get a plan of action, what is needed for you to do to be free and recover. Yeah. Uh, which reminded me, I've done that with my students last semester. I, I need to do it now with every semester. My students, I make them take the sugar addiction questionnaires. And that's when they, that's when their minds are. Yeah, the core, the, yeah, the light goes off. Oh, yeah. And oh, now they're yes. paying attention to every little thing. They're saying like, oh my yeah. God. That, and right. they're young. Imagine at 18 yeah. having such high oh. addiction. What's yeah. going to happen when they're 30 and 40? You know? I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. And even if you don't take next step with you now, you planted the seeds. Exactly. I used to joke and say, I'm a seed bomber. You know, I brought seeds. <laughs> so it's, it's and so people come back. Yeah. That's what I tell them. I know that the vast majority of my students aren't going to go carnivore or sober the next day, mm -hmm. but I, but I tell them, I'm just planting the seed. You're 18 yes. now, you know, you don't have autoimmune issue. You don't have anything. You, most of you are doing pretty well, right. but right. you'll never forget this. And it's going to come back and uh, be in your toolbox once you need it. And that's, I've done my job yeah. just by doing that. So, yeah. Thank Beautiful. you. Thank you so Beautiful. much. Good yeah. luck with all your wonderful work. Keep working. Keep going. Thank you. Nothing can stop me. Right? We Good. keep going. <laughs> Thank you, Vitten. It's been my honor to host you and, and interview you today. And I just appreciate you giving me Thank and the audience this time and your wisdom. Thank you. And, you know, I wish you the best out there. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for sticking with us till the end. If you enjoyed this kind of content, make sure you give this YouTube video a thumbs up, subscribe, and hit that little notification bell icon so YouTube alerts you every time I post a new video. Thank you. And until we meet again. Mm -hmm.